Stress can be defined as a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. But how do different kinds of stress cause long-term effects on our brain and body? Stress usually is created when we can't predict the future outcome, when we feel that we can't control the situation, or when we have the perception that there's a threat, a danger, or a perception that something's going to get worse in our lives. You may not be able to control everything that happens in your life or your outer world. However, is it possible that you can learn how to control your inner world of thoughts and feelings? I'm your host, Dr. Joe Dispenza, and in the previous episode, we went into depth on the ancient practice of meditation and what it means to be truly present. In this episode, we're going to identify different kinds of stress, show you the long-term effects of stress, how it can create illness in your body, and once you understand what stress can do to you, it's my hope that the information you'll learn will empower you to make some important changes in your life. There are three types of stress. There's physical stress, chemical stress, and emotional stress. Now, physical stress are things like traumas, accidents, injuries, falls, chemical stress, flus, bacteria, viruses, blood sugar levels, toxins in food, emotional stress, family tragedy, second mortgages, single parenting, traffic jams. And all of these different stressors, whether they're physical, chemical, or emotional, knock your brain and body out of balance. In fact, the definition of stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of homeostasis. Now the stress response is what your body innately does to return itself back to order. When you or any organism in nature begins to perceive a danger or a threat in their external environment, they turn on a primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system. And when the person or the organism is perceiving that danger, the body innately begins to mobilize enormous amounts of energy and resources. All of its energy now is being mobilized to be able to adapt to the stress in the environment. So then we begin to tap the body's vital resources so that we can survive the condition in the outer world. All organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress whether it's a zebra being chased by a lion, or whether it's a pack of coyotes chasing a deer, the moment the organism perceives that danger and switches on that emergency system, there is a rush of adrenaline and a rush of energy, and there is an arousal that takes place in the brain and body. And those chemicals then alter our normal homeostasis. And in that state of survival, we switch on that sympathetic nervous system, or what's called the fight or flight nervous system. And our pupils dilate, our salivary juices shut down, it's not a time to eat. Our heart rate increases, our respiratory rate increases, blood is sent to the extremities, and it's shut down in the internal organs because it's a time to run, it's a time to fight, or it's a time to hide. Now, if the zebra or the deer outrun the predator, 30 minutes later, the stress response begins to switch off and the body returns back to balance. After there's a stress response, many organisms need to rest and repair because the body has to come back online and regenerate and conserve energy. What if, though, you're being chased by T-Rex and you're turning on that primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system? And the moment you perceive that threat and you're in danger and now you're running from the predator, that's very adaptive. But what if then the predator is waiting outside the cave and waiting for you to go out and get some food? We could say then that your ability to sustain a certain stress response would be extended. But what if it isn't T-Rex outside the cave? What if it's your coworker? What if it's your mother-in-law? What if it's your boss? What if it's traffic? And what was once highly adaptive becomes very maladaptive. Because when you turn on the stress response and you can't turn it off, now you're headed for disease because no organism can live in emergency mode for an extended period of time. 
Reason this with me. If you keep mobilizing enormous amounts of energy for some threat in your outer world, there's no energy in your inner world for growth and repair. So think of the sympathetic nervous system as the emergency system that's like the gas pedal in the car. The other nervous system, called the parasympathetic nervous system, that nervous system is the nervous system of relaxation, of regeneration, of metabolism. So if a person is living in a constant state of stress, and they, like an addict, become conditioned to the rush of the arousal of those chemicals, then in time then, they will begin to use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their conditioning or their addiction to that emotion. We become so conditioned to these chemicals that like a drug addict, we need the bad job. We need the poor relationship. We need a difficult situation in our life to keep getting that rush of adrenaline, to keep getting that rush of energy. And in a sense, people become addicted to the life they don't even like. So then because of the size of the neocortex, the thinking brain as you learned about, we can make thought more real than anything else. And people can begin to think about their problems. And as they begin to think about their problems, they can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. And we now know that those chemicals can become addictive. And you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. So then you can become addicted to your own thoughts. So it's a scientific fact that the long-term effects of the hormones of stress push the genetic buttons that create disease. And you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. It means then that your thoughts can literally make you sick. And so many diseases around the world now are created by the immune system being suppressed, or what we call immune-mediated diseases. Everything from cancer, MS, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, food allergies, food sensitivities is a compromise in the immune system. So here's the question. If your thoughts can make you sick, is it possible that your thoughts can make you well? Well, we did a research study where we took 117 people and we wanted to measure their cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone, and another chemical called IgA, immunoglobulin A. It's your body's primary defense against bacteria and viruses. So as cortisol levels go up and you're mobilizing enormous amounts of energy for some threat in your outer world, the immune system dials down and now the immune system becomes compromised because all of the energy is going for a threat in the outer world, our immune system becomes suppressed. So typically, IgA levels go down. So we measured the cortisol and IgA levels, and we put them through four days of training. And we asked them to trade emotions like anger and frustration and hatred and violence and aggression and competition and fear those are all the chemicals that are derived from the stress hormones. We ask them to trade those survival emotions for elevated emotions, heartfelt emotions, like gratitude, appreciation, kindness, care, love for life, a joy for existence. And all we wanted them to do for 10 minutes a day was open their hearts and begin to feel those elevated emotions. At the end of three and a half days, we went back and we remeasured those same values. And their immune system, that is, IgA levels went up as a collective, about 50%. Their cortisol levels dropped about 16.25%. Their stress hormones went down, and their immune system upregulated to a great degree. That means then, when you begin to make a change in the way you think and the way you feel, and you begin to change your attitude, and you begin to open your heart again and feel an elevated emotion, it is those elevated emotions that begin to restore and repair the immune system.